Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As a little kid, Palm Sunday was one of my favorites. After the solemn, even dour, self-denial of Lent, here was a chance to whoop it up in church with palms. <laughs> At St. Bartholomew's, we started our parade outside in the courtyard, gathered around a bonfire, another amazing thing, and we were handed our palms. Now ours were those long, skinny, pale green, pointy kind, which my brothers immediately turned into swords, while I braided mine into a dainty cross. We were completely on brand, the three of us. <laughs> After great anticipation, the parade began to start and we'd wind around the church and then we'd come into the sanctuary and the organ music would swell as we filled the nave waving our palm and singing out, all glory, laud, and honor. It felt like we were leaving the darkness and shadows of those 40 days of Lent behind us outside with that bonfire. Lent was finally over and Jesus was coming and everything was going to be just great from here on in. At least that's how I remember it. This morning, with all of our celebration, we might be forgiven for thinking the same thing. And let's be honest, this past Lent was brutal. Long, early, gray, cold. It started with Ash Wednesday, coinciding with Valentine's Day, which was the same day my mother died. I was hoping to begin Lent by taking some time for a, a personal retreat to embrace the powerful spirituality of the season and get in the right head and heart space. I was going to delve into the writings of great Irish mystics, begin and end my day in deep prayer, practice my newfound passion, which is playing the Celtic harp. But instead, <laughs> get, don't get any ideas, choir. <laughs> but instead, I was planning my mom's funeral and I was comforting my grieving dad and writing the eulogy with my brothers, who sometimes still remind me of those little boys with their palm frond swords. And I was unprepared for my grief. But it was so much more than just personal pain that colored the season. Add to that the heartbreak and anxiety that we all feel in this world on fire. The devastation and death in Palestine. The continued bloodshed in Ukraine. The climate catastrophes that seem to arrive bigger and stronger each season. And the disturbing and quite frankly sickening language coming from candidate Trump. It feels like the very worst of our shadow side is blaring across our screens each and every day. For many of us I know it feels that we have stumbled through these six weeks of Lent with a heaviness almost too hard to bear. And so today, I am ready to let loose with the crowd and dance and shout and give a big exuberant welcome to Jesus, who no doubt has come to fix all of this. To dispel these shadows and lift our burdens and lead us out of this Lenten wilderness into the bright spring sunshine of God's world, a place of justice and mercy and peace. That's the world that the folks lining the roadside in Jerusalem that morning were hoping for. That's the promise they saw in Jesus. Finally, they thought, God is showing up for us and not a moment too soon. This is going to be big. And there was good reason for all that hope and anticipation. For all this excitement had been building for a while. You see, as Jesus thinks about this turning point moment in his ministry, as he leaves the countryside and heads into the big city, the seat of power, the home of the temple, he wants to send a message to the people about who he is and what he's here to do. For it's in Jerusalem where Jesus' message of love and the empire's message of fear will collide. And everything is riding on this. So the entry has to be memorable. 
One of the things that we learn when we delve deeply into these gospel stories is that these pivotal events do not happen in a vacuum. Jesus doesn't just arrive all of a sudden on the scene with a whole new story about God. No, Jesus is continuing the story that the people already knew. The one that goes all the way back to Exodus, to Genesis, really. It's a story of promise, a promise of freedom, of flourishing, of harmonious community. It's a promise of childless nomads becoming parents to a great nation, of enslaved people breaking their chains, of exiles being brought home. These were the stories that sustained the Hebrew people through centuries of brutal occupation and domination. And they needed to hear that story today. For on that very same road into Jerusalem, there were Roman soldiers on every corner. There were gilded palaces overshadowing the beggars in the streets. And there were crosses looming on that hill right above the city. All of this was to remind the people that Rome was in charge now and they had best stay in their place. But despite all of their hardship and heartbreak, all their burden and deprivation and that pervasive sense of threat, the story that God is with them, that God will send a deliverer, a Messiah, will not die. They keep telling it again and again and now, now, it seems they are coming closer to it, closer to their deliverance than ever. For they'd watched Jesus over these past three years. They'd witnessed his miracles, creating feasts out of crumbs and calming storms and even raising his friend from the dead. They'd heard him teach about this new kind of world, one he called the kingdom of God. It was an upside down kind of world where the first would be last the last would be first, debts would be forgiven, the blind would see, and the captives would go free. Who else but the Messiah could say and do such miraculous things? This had to be Jesus. And this morning, Jesus himself is making that clear. For this palm-strewn celebration is not a spontaneous, accidental parade. As he comes riding in on the foal of a donkey, the most awkward and humble animal you can Im imagine, Jesus takes a page directly from the prophet Zechariah. Riding 500 years earlier, in the midst of war-torn Jerusalem, when the Hebrew people were attacked and captured by the Babylonians, Zechariah foretold of a day when God would enter the city of Jerusalem and reclaim it for them. Rejoice greatly, O Zion. Shout, O Jerusalem, Zechariah writes. See, your king comes to you, righteous and gentle, and riding on a donkey, the foal of a donkey. God says, I will take away the chariots of Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. I will claim peace to all the nations of the earth. So Jesus didn't need to spell it out for the people. They took one look at this parade and they knew that Messiah is here and he's going to change everything. You see, unlike the Roman military parade entering Jerusalem through the West Gate that very same morning, Jesus' East Gate parade is a counter-demonstration. It's street theater protest that reenacts Zechariah's prophecy. Yes, Jesus is saying, I am here to liberate you from all that oppresses. I am here to create a new kind of community, a place of peace and justice where weapons are destroyed and God dwells right here in the heart of the people. And the people cannot get enough. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, they cry. Hosanna in the highest. Surely everything is going to be okay now. But here's another thing we learn in those gospel accounts. And that is that these sacred stories are also human stories. Human stories about God and what God is doing. And because they are human, they say a lot about who we are. Our human fingerprints are all over them. And so there is a shadow side 
to those shouts and cries, to those hails and hosannas, another side to the story that Jesus carries with him into Jerusalem that morning. And it's a heavy one. For even though the crowds are caught up in that underdog energy and dramatic symbolism of the moment, Jesus knows this joy will not last. For in their raucous celebration, the people have forgotten the other message that Jesus has taught them, the one that even his closest friends could not understand, that this liberating vision of God's kingdom will cost us something, that we will have to let go of our age-old framing of power not just to turn the table on the oppressors, but to forgive them and invite them into the recreation of the world. They have forgotten that this new kingdom can only come about if we are willing to give up the old kingdom entirely. And that means letting go of our dreams of a powerful conquering hero, even if he is our powerful conquering hero. It means owning our complicity with the ways of the world that keep the victor and victim locked in a never-ending cycle of violence and vengeance. We can call for Jesus to save us from the struggles of the world, but we really don't want our worldview to change. We are happy for God to tinker around the edges, exchange this powerful leader for that one, raise our fortunes, but ignore those whose work provides it. Deliver peace to our country, but threaten the peace of our enemy. Just like those crowds, we are happy to pay lip service to the Prince of Peace as long as we don't have to give up our addiction to the spoils of war. Like us, they have forgotten Jesus' teaching that God's realm can only be made real when we are willing to let go of our ego-driven, fear-based selves and change our hearts. Like them, we've forgotten that Jesus told us he would have to suffer and die for this toxic cycle to be broken. We have forgotten that being the Messiah means surrendering all so that all can be redeemed. And this is the true heart of Holy Week. The paradox that it is in confronting the powers of death that we will truly save our lives. That it is only in defying the fears of the world that we can create that kingdom of love. And it is only in seeing our human fingerprints, our fingerprints all over this story, that we can claim the power to change it and write it on our hearts so that the ancient story becomes our new story to live and to tell. Today, Jesus embodies that story in this parade, and it was no accident. So let it ignite our imaginations to see that liberating work of God happening right here, right now, even among the shadows and the heartbreak and the pain that we have been carrying for so long. For the Prince of Peace is coming, and through him a new world is possible. Hosanna! Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. May it be so. Amen.